good evening guys happy 4th of July now granted the video won't be up today on the 4th but that's when I'm shooting it so want to get back to you guys who uh, have been patiently waiting for more answers from the Q&A video because I did not get to all of the questions that were there so we're going to continue on with the Q&A I'm also going to be answering some other questions from the other videos as well and We'll try to do this once in a while. Um, we're just going to try to do this every now and again, and I can explain a little better in this format, you know, and it lets us get a little more interaction with each other, and it's kind of fun. It's The interaction back and forth has been really fun, though. So I do appreciate it, guys, once again. So... I promised him I'd uh, do his question first on the next one, on the last video, I, or in the comments. Uh, Jeff Labrazi. Now, Jeff, I am sorry if I butchered your name, man. Let me know. Um, now, Jeff is uh, Jeff's a good, loyal viewer. I tell you what, he always uh, comments a lot, and it's appreciated, and he always has some good questions. Sounds like Jeff is trying to get into his own project, and he's going to be milling it with a chainsaw. Hats off to you, man. I know what that's all about, and that's hard. So so Jeff wants to know, he wants to know about the peg size, diameter, any rules of thumb, how long to cut the joints, things like that. And Frugal Drew had asked the same question about how long does it take to cut the joints. So... Your peg size, the diameter of your peg, is half the thickness of your tenon. So, if you have a 2 inch tenon, you're going to have a 1 inch diameter peg. If you have an inch and a half tenon, technically you should have a 3 quarter inch peg. Um, and going along with the layout there, so you hear, uh, and my understanding of it is, again, if I'm wrong, I actually have a uh, I have a viewer and a friend who will let me know, and he's actually been in an encyclopedia of information for me on this. So thanks, Jim. Once again, you get more honorable mentions here than anybody. Um, so your your peg layout where it's going to go in the joint um, for most of your tenons. Say so. Say you have a a two inch thick tenon. You have a one inch diameter peg. Your you're gonna do a two by two layout. So let's see if I can get you an example of that here. All right. So let's see if we can explain this without me jiggling the camera too much. So say I have a wall post here. And I have a tie beam coming into it here. Um, this isn't how I do my housing, but I'm kind of using this for an example here. So, so I have a 2 inch thick tenon, and I have my 1 inch thick peg. So that's my peg hole right there, and I've got another one down here. So say this one... Uh, how I do it, and maybe I'm wrong, but this is just my understanding of it, guys. Um, Jim Rogers, if you watch this, please let me know, and then I will amend it if I need to. But this is how I've been doing them. And like I said, when you're learning by the seat of your pants, maybe you don't always do it right, but this is just how I'm going. So there's my little disclaimer for the evening. So how I do it, if it's a 2-inch tenon, 1-inch peg... I measure off of this face right here two inches, so that's there. I put a mark, and then I will measure from here down two inches. So it's called a two by two layout. So down two inches, in two inches. All right, that's how I that's how I lay my pegs out. Your braces are a little bit different, and when I go to uh, do, I've got a lot more brace work to do for the second floor. I'm going to get into that a lot more in detail. So that's how I do it. So again, your peg diameter 
is going to be half of the tenon thickness. Your layout's going to follow. So I use, like I said, a two inch tenon, two by two layout. Two inches over, two inches down. So that's how I'm doing them. So, Jeff, I hope that answers your questions. Um, if, like I said, I, I will be giving you some more detail uh, basically when I get into the second floor joinery more, kind of, uh, the second floor is going to be kind of like a reset on the project for me, you know what I mean? It kind of makes it new again because it's been so repetitive what I'm into now and I'm still enjoying it, don't get me wrong, but I'm, I'm looking forward to moving on to different joints and things like that. So, anyhow, and the other, and to answer his and uh, Frugal Drew's question, about how many hours per joint, how long the project's taking. Uh, the way I figured it, in the close to two years I've been working on this project, and that includes, that time includes the groundwork, the concrete work, the, uh, the waiting for the logs, things like that, and I spent a lot of time, I probably spent most of the time waiting for logs. So if you're going to source your own timbers, get a good supplier. You don't want to be stuck waiting for the next load of logs before you can make any more progress on it. Um, but total time, if I were to figure actual time of actually able to work on this project, I'm going to figure, if we're talking 40 hour weeks, probably about a month and a half. So really, I've been making pretty good time. It's just like I've, I've said in a few videos, it's all the stuff that happens in between that keeps you from being able to do it, being able to work on it. But... That stuff's not a big deal. It's all stuff that has to get done. So, anyhow, moving along. Well, I guess I better answer uh, the joinery questions. Those big scarf joints, those four foot long ones you see in the tie beams, I've got those down to about four hours to do one of those now. The first time I did one, it took me about two days. <laughs> you know, so when you guys are doing your own projects and you're just starting out and you're new to it like I am, the first few joints you cut of any kind, they're going to take you a little bit longer than you think they should. Don't get discouraged because you're going to find you're going to get faster and more accurate with them as you go. A big difference in the fit in my scarf joints between the first two and the last few. You know what I mean? Big difference. And like I said before in that video where I was cutting the scarf joint, just like any other kind of woodworking or anything like that, it's the patience it takes to do it right. It's not that you can't do it right because you can do it right. It's the patience to make it right. So, moving along. And I'm so organized tonight, guys. About half dead to the world. We've been, been going pretty hard up here. But I'm sure a lot of you folks have too, so... Mike Hegdahl, and again, I apologize, guys, I apologize if I butcher your names. Um, ridicule me, do what you got to do. So, Mike Hegdahl, he wrote, What do you do for income? Um, so, my main livelihood is I'm a commercial and industrial HVAC and refrigeration mechanic. So, basically, I'm... I'm the guy that keeps your supermarket refrigeration running, your chillers, your big boilers, stuff like that, your rooftop air conditioning units. Uh, what I do, we kind of, the company I work for, we do a little bit of all of it. Um, it's a good field to get into if any of you guys are at a point in your life, and I meet a lot of guys who get into this trade later in life. Um, I have guys in their late 30s I work with, you know, who just started. I see guys in their 40s getting into it. There's a big shortage of people in the trades in this country right now, and probably all over the world. But here in the U.S., there's a uh, big shortage of people getting in the trades. So what I'm seeing in the trades is the income for tradesmen it's going up drastically every year because there's just not enough people getting into it. Now, I have nothing against a college education. If you have one, good for you. That's wonderful. The work you've put in to earn that is phenomenal. Nothing wrong with that at all. But I highly encourage any of you folks 
who are at a crossroads in your life or you're young, you're just starting out, you're not sure what you want to do, you don't want to go to college, you, you just, you're not sure, pick up a trade, man. Just pick one up. You know, whether it's an electrician, whether it's HVAC, a carpenter, a plumber, doesn't matter. There's such a lack of people nowadays working with their hands that if you can become good at what you do, I tell you what, you can write your own paycheck. And that's not a bad place to be. So, and Mike and I, Mike and I talked about this a little bit in the back and forth in the comments on what the trades and and what's going on with those. So, but anyhow, we're gonna move on. Debt free homesteaders, another loyal viewer. Hello, um, wants to know. Are you filming with a phone? What editing software am I using? So, I have my wife's Nikon Coolpix camera I've been doing a lot of the filming with. Um, and it works alright. It's an older, it's not that old, but it's a few years old. But at work, we just got, uh, they just gave me a new iPhone 7S at work to, uh, and I'm actually filming this with that, and I'm finding that it does a better job than the uh, Nikon camera I've been using. The sound's better, the picture's better. It's not bad, it works better in the wind. Um, so it's nice. The, uh, the editing software I use is DaVinci Resolve 12.5. It's a free software download. It's been pretty good, it's been pretty glitch free. The only glitches I've had with it are the ones that I've caused myself, and uh, so it's not bad. It takes a little getting used to using it, doing any of it. I'm, it's another thing I'm learning as I go is how to edit, how to try to make the stuff better, and so that's what I'm using. I'm going to move on. Uh, Dwayne R1981, is that your land behind you? As a matter of fact, it is. A lot of the land you see in the videos belongs to myself and my father-in-law. We, uh, we farm together, and that's, that's our thing. Um, my wife and I just bought into the family land this past, well, about a year and a half ago. So, all together, the land that we farm is probably, I'm going to say, close to 300 acres. And we're just doing that on the side. So if you can't tell, if I ever look like I'm about to fall asleep in a video or something like that, like I feel like it right now, or I'm just rambling on incoherently, my eyes are glazed over, that usually means it's summertime up here on the farm. So you're actually, uh, you're going to see less barn videos coming up for a little while, and you're going to see a lot more fixing equipment videos, a lot more repairs of welding and things like that. Um, I've actually uh, had one of my tractors out here. I have to swap a radiator out of it. I'm going to try to make a radiator from a Alice Chalmers 185 fit into a Alice Chalmers 180 because rather than spending the 800 bucks to buy a new one, well, I'm just going to go the cheap route and uh, try to fix the one that's leaking and take the good one out of a tractor we don't use a lot. But there'll be a video on that. I try to watch my language pretty good on the videos. Unfortunately, I have a filthy mouth at times. And uh, I try to keep it under control. <laughs> but when we get into the farm equipment videos, there's going to probably be some severe editing out of constant cussing of the antique aggravation that is on this farm. <laughs> Everything we have is old. We have one new tractor between the two of us. My father-in-law bought it and that's a uh, 70 horse Mahindra tractor. Beautiful tractor. For us it's a Cadillac but everything else is from the early 70s and before. Works great. It's just a lot of upkeep. So anyhow let's keep going here. John Lowe wanted to know what brand Forstner bit I was using in the tie beam mortise video for the uh, for the knee brace. He also wanted to know if I had sharpened it by hand. That is a 
cheap Irwin, I shouldn't say cheap, Irwin makes pretty good stuff, but it's a very well priced Irwin self-feeding Forstner bit. Um, I picked up a few of them for this project thinking I was going to drill peg holes and things like that with them, which is not a good idea. I ended up buying some ship auger bits that were wood bits. With the ship auger bits, you don't want the nail eater bits that you get at your electrical supply house or Home Depot. Get online, look around for, uh, if you can swing at some wood owl bits. I'm using cheap warrior bits. I've sharpened them up for the auger bits. I've sharpened them up so they work well and they actually have a cutter and they don't have the nail cutter on them. They actually have a sharp cutting edge that cuts the wood, scores it around as the drill's drilling down. It gives you a clean hole. So, But the Forstner bit I was using was an Irwin bit and I did not sharpen it. didn't have to do anything with it. I'm actually very impressed with that bit, with those all those bits that I've used. They're self-feeders. They cut extremely clean holes. I'm going to tell you with a uh, when you're using a Forstner bit to do this kind of work, you really have to make sure you're drilling straight. It is very easy to get out of whack because it's kind of hard to put a square up against it like you can with an auger bit. So just a little food for thought. Another thing you can use if you are if you are drilling holes like that for mortises, you're drilling peg holes, probably the best thing you can do and probably the the more pure thing if you're looking to go traditional timber frame without the power tools and everything is a uh, you can get a boring machine. It's just a, it's a hand crank machine. You can find them for sale once in a while. Uh, Jim Rogers, the gentleman I keep mentioning, he has he has a little business where he restores timber framing tools like that and sells them. He does nice work on them. They work well when he's done with them. The name of Jim Rogers' uh, tool business is Vintage Tools NE. I'm assuming the NE is New England. Jim is about as crusty of a New Englander as you're going to meet. The very blunt kind, but boy does he have good information. Tell you what guys, if you are looking to do timber framing, get on the fight. I encourage you to get on the forestry forum. Read through the sticky threads in there. There's such good information. It's hard to find information that good for free anywhere, and it's right there for you. All you got to do is get on there and look. Um, there's some knowledgeable guys on there. And Jim, Jim Rogers has taken a lot of time to make a lot of sticky threads. He's the moderator of that section of the, of the forestry forum. And a lot of the rules of thumb I use, I got from right there. Um, he's got a good list of them, the basic, the basic rules, the basic layout rules, things like that, some of the basic do's and don'ts. It's good information, it's clear information, and I can't say enough good about the man. He knows more about this stuff than I'm probably ever going to know, and he's also been very patient with me if I do something Say I'm doing a video and the information I put out isn't, it's good information, but it's not exactly proper in terms of timber framing and things like that. Jim very respectfully lets me know that and then I pass it along to you guys. So again, you can find vintage tools for timber framing through him, through uh, Vintage Tools NE. And so, anyhow. I got off on a tangent there a little bit, didn't I, guys? Okay, Thane Grooms. There's another another viewer that pops up quite a bit in the comments. And again, I, I try to thank all you guys who do that because it is appreciated. What is your wall height? What are your thoughts on siding, insulation, tar paper? And... Yeah, I guess that's about it. I kind of I kind of wrote the questions down in shorthand here, and I'm trying to decipher what the hell I wrote. So, my wall height to the top of the wall post is 14 feet to the 
shoulder of the tenon. All right, to the top of the tenon is 14 feet 5 inches. So, and on top of that, I'm going to have a 10 by 10 wall post. So, by the time it's all said and done, earth, a 10 by 10 wall plate, not wall post. See, I got to sleep, guys. This is awful. I'm always messing up my terminology. I do it all the time. But uh, anyhow, by the time I get my top plates on the barn, the walls are going to be 14 feet, 10 inches high, and then you're going to have rafters on top of that. So, bottom of my tie beams is 10 feet. Now, I laid out my I, I laid out my girts on three foot centers where I could. I dropped them. I did that to keep them below the knee braces, and there is a way you can do it and have them right tight to the knee braces, but I didn't know it at the time when I started doing this. So my siding on the barn, originally I was going to go with board and batten, and I have a friend up in Maine, up in near Bar Harbor, Maine, and he told me one time, and ever since he told me, I, I've thought about it, and he's absolutely right. Board and batten is like a picket fence. It, it looks nice, but I've never had good luck with board and batten keeping water out. It doesn't keep the wind out. You think about it, you've got a bunch of seams running vertically. Water's just going to run in behind those bats. Especially if you're using green lumber, which I'm doing, that lumber's going to shrink. You're going to have gaps in there. Doesn't matter what you do, you're going to have them. That water's going to run behind stuff. It's going to get into your building sooner or later. I mean, if you look around the shop, I mean, look under behind that yellow bucket there in the background. You see the dark marks? Yeah, you can kind of see them in the corner. That's water stains from where water from rain has just seeped in into the seams. And I will probably never put board and batten on another building again. If I do, it's going to be an outside siding layer. And there will be sheathing and a vapor barrier behind it. Um, so I've come to the decision what I'm going to do to side this barn. I'm going to cut clapboards, wide clapboards, on the sawmill. And what I'm going to do with that, I'm going to run my siding horizontally. So when the rain hits, it can run down the siding and shed off and not go in the seams. I would like to do, I'd love to do a sheathing layer with like zip seal and so, or something like that and a vapor barrier, but unfortunately the budget for the building is drying up rapidly, so, and that's hard. Some of you guys doing some of these projects, you're going to sit there and you're going to think, oh, it shouldn't cost that much, but it's always the stuff you don't plan for that ends up costing you. Um, I mean, really, this building isn't costing that much to do by the time I'm all said and done with it. If you include the uh, sawmill into it and everything, I'm probably going to have about 16000 into the building, including the sawmill and the concrete by the time it's all said and done. I'm talking glass for the windows because I'm going to make the windows myself. I'm talking uh, the sawmill, the concrete, the roofing material. The sawmill was six grand, concrete was four grand, right about in there just under. The uh, roofing is going to be about 1300 so it all adds up. Um, something else you want to consider when you're building one of these is the sheer amount of board footage that's going to go into a building like this. I'm going to have close to 30,000 board feet of lumber into this building by the time it's all said and done. That's a lot of lumber. So that cost, you know. Usually if you're buying it from a sawmill like around here, it goes 40 cents a board foot. So that's what, and 30,000, that's probably close to 14,000 in lumber if I were to buy the lumber instead of mill it. That's why I bought the sawmill. I'm actually, that sawmill's already paid for itself on this project, hands down. So it was worth the investment. But anyhow, I hope the information was clear and concise. Um, 
I tried to do that. I can't tell you how many times I've shot something like this and it's hard for me to sit and talk at the camera but I think it's pretty important to share all aspects of this experience with you guys. Um, all in all, don't be afraid to do these projects. They're, it's worth it. There really is something special about doing something the old ways. Now, I'm not talking get out there and build a mud hut, you know what I mean? I, I just This style of building, vintage, you know, woodworking the old ways with hand tools and stuff like that, seeing how your forefathers did it, it's it's an awful special thing. It's I can't tell you how cool it is to be able to do it and say, hey, I can do that, you know. It's turning into a forgotten art and it's making a comeback, but it's slow. I encourage anybody who's interested in doing this, start getting some books, start reading through, pick up what you can, you'll fall in love with it. But uh, so anyhow enough of my rambling tonight thank you guys for watching i'll catch you on the next one um, like i said the barn videos are going to slow down a little bit but there's going to be a lot more on the farm and stuff and it's going to be a busy summer because it's been so wet i haven't even gotten in the hay field yet usually i'm half done by now so anyhow you guys have a good night i'll catch you on the next one and take her easy